Good morning, Grace Church. Peace be with you. It is so great to be with you again today. If it's your first time at Grace, I, I want to welcome you today. My name's Kev, and I'm here for my third and final week uh, before Pastor John um, jumps back in here with y'all next uh, next Sunday. Now we're just gonna get right to it. Today's passage is uh, it's it's awesome. This is a this is a bumper sticker verse uh, for some. For some, it's a tattoo uh, verse. It's just one of the most beloved verses that you're gonna find in all the Bible. And so I'll go ahead and I'll share with y'all right now. This is Jeremiah 29, verse 11. And it reads, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. This is, I mean, it is. This is a beautiful verse that is filled with beautiful words. But this morning, what I want to do, I want to do something, maybe a little something different. I, I want to, I want to place this verse back into the context of the story in which it was given. Because I think in a lot of ways, uh, the way Jeremiah 29, 11 gets, gets used today is more like, it's more like a soundbite. And sound bites are very powerful tools uh, in our world, but they don't always take us into the fullness of truth. And so what I want us to do with Jeremiah 29-11 today is I want us to take a deeper cut. And I'm just going to be super honest up front with you. There is a chance that you're not going to like this message like at all. And which I'm sure Pastor John's going to be super stoked on me saying that right up, up front. But as I shared with you, the truth is that Jeremiah 29, 11, the reality of it is not for the faint of heart. It gets to some incredibly deep places spiritually that not everyone is willing to, to go. And so we're going we're, we're, we're gonna to see, all right, how, how, how this goes here. So uh, this past year, I was at a conference uh, that was focused on the engagement of young adults in the life of, of local churches. And this one speaker, he was talking about the ways in which people grow. And he brought up this tension uh, that parents all over country, all over our world uh, face. And that's, he says, he said that there are two things uh, that all of us want for our kids. Two things we all want for our kids. One is we would rather our kids not experience pain. We'd rather them be able to avoid pain. But at the same time, the second thing we want for them, but we also want for them to grow up to be resilient adults. And so you can see right away, those two priorities are wanting our kids to not experience pain. And yet at the same time, having them grow up to be uh, with a sense of resiliency, there is a tension between those two priorities. Because what is the chief way in which you or I or anyone has resiliency built into their character? I mean, it comes through working through difficult situations. I mean, if you think about it, it really, when it comes down to it, it's, it's just, it's just all about, it's, it's all about math, right? It just comes back to math, which for some of you, you hear math and you get super excited because, you know, you're weird and stuff. But others of you, you, you hear, but you hear about math and there's like a, a U shaped hole that's going to be like at the front door of your house. But there are studies out there when it comes to growth in subjects like math that really what it comes down to is a willing to not, willingness to not give up on that subject or even on individual problems. It involves the discipline to take the time to do hard things. And I can't, I wonder if ever in our lifetime have we needed this reminder of the importance of being able to do hard things more than we be, need to be reminded right now. So I want to look at two words uh, with you really quickly. They're going to apply um, to our passage today. And those words are resilience and perseverance. I mean, resilience involves the capacity to recover from, recover, bounce back, right? Involves that bounce back from difficult life circumstances. Uh, I was thinking about the team that won the World Series last year. It was the Washington Nationals. And there was a stat about them that is astounding. This is from last year's playoffs. Um, I believe it was five times, five times, that team played in what are called elimination games, which means for the loser of that game, that elimination game, the loser goes home. Season's over. Five times the Nationals played in elimination games. In all five of those games, they fell behind. And yet, in all five of those games in which they were behind, they came back to win. I'm all five, unbelievable. I'm not sure a team will ever do this again. Unbelievable. That is resilience. 
The second word, perseverance, essentially a perseverance, it involves the ability to keep going. That, that ability, that, that will to stay the course even when things do not appear to be working out. You just keep going. I mean, I would ask you, does our culture breed perseverance? I can't even get into a line at Costco without trying to find a quicker way out of that place, right? So resilience and perseverance. Now, I want to, I want to get in the actual uh, context and plot line, plot line of Jeremiah 21. So we'll start here uh, in verse 1 where it reads, This is the text of the letter that the prophet Jeremiah sent from Jerusalem to the surviving elders among the exiles and to the priests, the prophets, and all the other people Nebuchadnezzar had carried into exile from Jerusalem uh, to, to Babylon. This was after King Jehoiachin and the queen mother, the court officials, and the leaders of Judah and Jerusalem, the skilled workers, and the artisans had gone into exile from uh, Jerusalem. And so... Jerusalem 29, it involves a letter uh, from a prophet named Jeremiah. It gets sent to a place called Babylon. Babylon is a kingdom that is under the leadership of a man named Nebuchadnezzar. The Babylonians at this point, they are the big empire on the block uh, at, at this time. And this letter takes place after they've invaded Judea and the Israelites are no match uh, for the kingdom of Babylon. People and resources of Israel are taken from Jerusalem back into Babylon. Now, in fact, what it says here in the letter is the letter is addressed to the surviving elders amongst the exiles. And so what is exile? Exile is to be taken away from your home without having the permission to return. It is a forced one-way ticket. In other words, those in exile, they're being taken to a foreign land where they're not going to be long. Uh, people in exile in general are in a situation that is not of their choosing. So you, you start there, right? And you realize any interpretation of Jeremiah 29 11 that says, see, look at the verse. God won't let any bad things happen in your life. He only pr plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Completely ignores the story in which that verse is actually written. Now the letter itself begins in verse 4. It says, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. I want you to see the phrase, this is what the Lord, Lord Almighty says to all those I carried, God says, into exile. God is making it very clear up front that this time of exile that is not of their choosing is happening under His guiding hand. It's not like God one day sort of put His eyes on Jerusalem and said, oh, where'd my people go? That's not the case. May, may, we, we know that, make no mistake, there are times when God's plan and direction is much different from what we uh, would expect. I mean, just about every one of us uh, in, in, uh, in this space today, we have had moments and situations that have occurred that were not, we, they're, they're not, that wasn't my plan. That was not based on the will of Kev. And I think many of us, I mean, some would say all of us are going through that experience right now. Proverbs 69 says, It is in their hearts, in their hearts, humans plan their course, but the Lord establishes their steps. Proverbs 19.21 says, Many, many are the plans. I'm like that, like that. A couple of my kids are like, Many are the plans in a person's heart. But it is the Lord's purposes that what? The Lord's purposes that prevail. This gets into the sovereignty of God. And the reality that when our plans seem, seem to be lining up with God's plans, then we love this truth. But what about when that is not the case? Are we able to maintain that, that sort of God is on the throne perspective in the midst of the unexpected? And so, you know, we get to Jeremiah 29, and, and we might ask in this space, what, what's happened to the Israelites? What is it, what's led them to this point? Now, in terms of their history, the Israelites, they had seen God intervene on their behalf time and time and time again. It happened when He led them out of Egypt. It happened during their time in the wilderness. It happened when they crossed the Jordan River. It happened when the walls of Jericho came tumbling down. It happened when, with Elijah on Mount Carmel. It happened uh, between da in that moment between David and Goliath again and again. This is a part of their story. Now, is it possible when that is your history, to then get to a point 
where you take the blessings and the intervention of God for granted. And then if we take all of that for granted, is it then possible to drift into behaviors that may run contrary to our call that God has put on our life? In the case of Israel, they had been warned, leading into Jeremiah 29, they had been warned many times to not take their place as God's chosen nation, God's chosen people, to not take that for granted. You can go all the way back um, to the book of Joshua, chapter 23, and you'll see, see a warning. Uh, it says, Now I'm about to go the way of all the earth. You know with all your heart and soul that not one of all the good promises the Lord your God gave you has failed. Every promise has been fulfilled. Not one has failed, but just as all the good things the Lord your God has promised you have come to you, so He will bring on you all the evil things He's threatened until the Lord your God has destroyed you from the good land He has given you. If you violate the covenant of the Lord your God, which He commanded you, and go and serve the other, uh, other gods and bow down to them, the Lord's anger will burn against you, and you will quickly perish from the good land He has given to you. Fast forward to Second Chronicles, uh, chapter thirty-six. The, the, these first, a uh, first wave of invasions and exile of the Israelites has already taken place here. There's sort of a puppet king uh, whose name is Zedekiah is put on the throne. He actually attempts a rebellion against uh, uh, Nebuchadnezzar that they, they were warned about, and all of it led to further disaster. But wanting to see um, what it says about the people at this time. 2 Chronicles 36, beginning uh, in verse uh, 14. Furthermore, all the leaders of the priests and the people became more and more unfaithful, following all the detestable practices of the nations and defiling the temple of the Lord, which he had consecrated in Jerusalem. The Lord, the God of their ancestors, sent word to them through his messengers again and again, but he had pity because he had pity on his people and on his dwelling place. But they mocked God's messengers, despised his words, and scoffed at his prophets until the wrath of the Lord was aroused against his people. And there was what? And there was no remedy. I mean, that's, that's big time right there. There was no remedy. In other words, the unfaithfulness of the people, even in the face of consistent warnings that God had delivered to them through His prophets, is this is ultimately what brings them to their Jeremiah 29 moment. They were exiled because they refused to listen. Now, and, and their disobedience. Now, Jeremiah's role in the story, it's interesting. I'll tell you this to Jeremiah 14. Um, and this is God is speaking to Jeremiah about the disaster that is about to fall upon Israel. This begins in verse 10. Uh, it reads, This is what the Lord says about this people. They greatly love to wander. They do not restrain their feet. So the Lord does not accept them. He will now remember their wickedness and punish them for their sins. Okay, God again, God is making this incredibly clear about what is coming and why it's happening. Verse 11. Then the Lord said to me, Do not do not, this is crazy. Do not pray for the well being of this people. Although they fast, I will not listen to their cry. Though they offer burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. Instead, I will destroy them with the sword, famine, and plague. I mean, this is this is like you like you can't make this stuff up. I mean, God, this is these are the cho this is the chosen nation of God, and God is telling Jeremiah, don't you even think about praying for them. Don't you even think about asking for good vibes on behalf of this people. Their fasting, their prayers, their offerings, none of it, none of it will be acceptable to me at this point. Verse 13, but I said, alas, sovereign Lord, the prophets keep telling them, you will not see the sword or suffer famine. Indeed, I will give you lasting peace in this place. So, I want you to Martin, no, take note of this. There are other prophets, other voices, besides the prophet Jeremiah, who are speaking into the people, and they're singing a different song. They're saying to the people, you've got nothing to worry about. Verse 14, the Lord said to me, the prophets are prophesying lies in my name. I've not sent them, or appointed them, or spoken to them. They are prophesying to you false visions, divinations, idolatries, and the delusions of their own mind. There are these who claim to be prophet. They're speaking to the people with authority. And what is coming out of them is the del delusions of their own mind. God says, he says, these messengers, they did not come from me. I did not send them. 
So for those in exile, they're receiving multiple voices. Some are telling them exactly what they want to hear, and then there are voices who are telling them things that they don't want to hear. I mean, our lives, the same thing's going to happen in our life. There are situations in your journey, even right now, where you are seeking counsel about a job, finances, relationships, about choices, decisions that are in front of you, about your faith. And as you seek, as we seek counsel, more often than not, you, like in your situations, you probably have a leaning of how you hope things are going to go. You have a will. I have, when it comes to the lives of my kids, there, there is Kev's will. When it comes to the financial future of my family, there is Kev's will. When it comes to what I hope for the, the church that I get to serve in, there is a Kev's will, right? We have a leaning of how we hope things will go in our lives. And so you often what we do is we look for people to just affirm what we already hope is true. We, may, we often make this mistake. What we, what, we, what we already want again and again, that's what we're looking for people to speak into, and that can be a disaster. Because if we do not allow space for contrarian voices in our lives, if we push out those people who may be seeking God's best for us, but their voice does not align with our preconceived will and desire, often the only one that we're going to be hurting is ourselves. In, in other words, it's true. we need to pay attention to the voices that we let in that are influencing, influencing us. And we need to pay attention to why it is that we let those voices, voices in. Is it because we respect that voice as a voice that also seeks after the heart of God? Or is it because that voice usually says what it is that we already want to hear? And the Israelites have reached that point where they stopped listening. And as a result, we get this. This is, this is going to get good. All right, Jeremiah 25, we'll do verse 1, and then we'll skip down to verse 4. Uh, the word came to Jeremiah concerning all the people of Judah in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, son of Josiah, king of Judah, which was the first year of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. Verse 4. And though the Lord has sent all his servants and prophets to you again and again, you have not listened or paid attention. They said, turn now, each of you, from your evil ways and your evil practices, and you can stay in the land the Lord gave to you and your ancestors forever and ever. Do not follow other gods to serve and worship them. Do not arouse my anger with what your hands have made. Then I will not harm you. But you did not listen to me, declares the Lord. And you have aroused my anger with what your hands have made. And you have brought harm upon yourselves. God is letting them know what is coming. And then what he does, you go through this and he does this in, in interesting ways. Uh, Jeremiah 27 verse 1. Early in the reign of Zedekiah, a son of Josiah, king of Judah, the word came to Jeremiah from the Lord. This is what the Lord said to me. Make a yoke out of straps and crossbars and put it on your neck. So this is got off of the prophets. There were these moments where it was like theater art, essentially, where they're sort of declaring God's truth, God's word to a people. And God asks them to engage, engage in, in, in various activities. In this case, God has asked Jeremiah to make a yoke. Make a yoke. This is familiar language in the Bible. Make a yoke and place it upon himself. The message is going to, uh, going to go out to multiple nations. The message is basically, I'm going to yoke all of you under Nebuchadnezzar's leadership. Eventually, his reign is going to end, but you all are going to be under him. You can go to verse 12. I gave, so I gave the same message to Zedekiah, king of Judah. I said, bow your neck under... So he's, you got to imagine, Jeremiah has this yoke upon him, and he's saying to Zedekiah, Zedekiah, bow your neck under the yoke of the king of Babylon. Serve him and his people, and you will live. Why will you and your people die by the sword, famine, and plague with which the Lord has threatened any nation that will not serve the king of Babylon? Don't listen to the words of the prophets who say to you, you will not serve the king of Babylon, for they are prophesying lies to you. It is just like, it is a clear message that God sends to the people. But there are some who just cannot believe that this is how it's going to be. And specifically, there is another prophet named Hananiah who comes onto the scene. And so what we have, and I, I love this, there's this prophet-to-prophet -prophet interaction between uh, Hananiah and Jeremiah. This is Jeremiah uh, 28. Hananiah speaking directly to Jeremiah on beginning of verse 2. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. 
I will break the yoke of the king of Babylon. Within two years, again, Jeremiah has the yoke on still, right? It's like he's saying, I will break the yoke, and Jeremiah's like, I'm still here, right? I will break the yoke of the king of Babylon. Within two years, I will bring back to this place all the articles of the Lord's house that Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, removed from here and took to Babylon. I will also bring back to this place Jehoiachin, son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, and all the other exiles from Judah who went to Babylon, declares the Lord, for I will break the yoke of the king of Babylon. This is, this is a clear... This is a declaration, right? This is a declaration. He's Jared, you got Jeremiah wearing the yoke that God has asked him to put on. Apparently, God hasn't told Jeremiah it's time to take it off. So he still has it on. And it's a picture of the people being yoked to the king of Babylon. And now you've got this other prophet getting real specific with his predictions, saying within 24 months, 24 months, God is going to break this yoke. And here, Jeremiah, to which Jeremiah responds, you can go back and read the rest of it. Jeremiah responds, Amen! Yes! Hananiah! That sounds fantastic. That would be fantastic. It's like, Jeremiah said, I would love for this to be true. All of us would want this. But then he gives Hananiah a warning. Okay, skipping down to verse 9. Jeremiah says to Hananiah, but the prophet who prophesies peace will be recognized as one truly sent by the Lord, only if his prediction comes true. And Jeremiah is like, two years sounds fantastic. Great. Sounds like great news. But it's specific. And if it does not happen, then Jeremiah is saying, Hananiah, Hananiah, you cannot be seen any longer as a prophet. This is a warning. And then this happens in Verse 10, Hananiah decides a good idea to double down, all right? And verse 10, it says, Then the prophet Hananiah took the yoke off the neck of the prophet Jeremiah, and he broke it. He broke it. And he said before all the people, This is what the Lord says. In the same way, I will break the yoke of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, off the neck of all the nations within two years. At this, the prophet Jeremiah went on his way. After the prophet Hananiah had broken the yoke off the neck of the prophet Jeremiah, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. Go and tell Hananiah, this is what the Lord says. You've broken a wooden yoke, but in its place you will get a yoke of iron. Skipping down to verse uh, 15. Then the prophet Jeremiah said to Hananiah the prophet, Listen, Hananiah, the Lord has not sent you, yet you have persuaded this nation to trust in lies. Therefore, this is what the Lord says. I'm about to remove you from the face of the earth. This very year you're going to die because you preach rebellion against the Lord. Verse 17, in the seventh month of that same year, Hananiah the prophet died. There's like... There's like a whole other sermon that I could preach to you about Hananiah breaking off the yoke that God had given to Jeremiah. You don't break off another man's yoke. God-given yoke. You don't do it. That yoke doesn't come off until God says it come, comes off. Being a prophet was not for the faint of heart. It's no joke. And so all this leads us then back to Jeremiah 29, where we started. A letter is written from this prophet to those in exile. The people are not where they want to be, and it's because of their sin. And they've been receiving these different messages from different voices. Some sound good to them, others not so much. And in the midst of all these voices, they are about to receive an incredibly difficult word. And this is it. This is Jeremiah 29, 5 and following. And this is, all, this is for all of you who are also who are wanting out of California right now. Just kidding. Kind of. Beginning in verse, in verse 5. This is what Jeremiah writes to them about being in Babylon. Build houses and settle down. Plant gardens, gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives to your sons and give, do give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there. Do not decrease. Also, seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it because if it prospers, you too will prosper. Pro Yes, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. Do not let the prophets and diviners among you deceive you. Don't listen to the dreams you encourage them to have. They are prophesying lies to you in my name. I have not sent them, declares the Lord. 
So again, they are given very specific instructions for live life in Babylon and all points in one direction, which is simply this. Hey, exiles, get comfortable. Get comfortable. You're not going anywhere for a while. Build houses, plant gardens, get married, have babies who also have babies, increase in number. It's basically, they are given the command that God gave Adam and Eve in the garden. God says, you want to know, you want to know what I want you to do in Babylon? Be fruitful and multiply. He says to them, seek the prosperity of the city that you're exiled in. Your fate is linked up with its fate. If things go bad there, it's going to be bad for you as well. And then finally, for the love of all that is holy, stop listening to any prophets who tell you differently and if you have some sort of dream or anyone else does that you're escaping from Babylon just know this that dream has not come from me who this, this is this is a hard word because this, this is what he's saying to them about their situation I want you to capture these two points because this is a call this is the call to the exiles it's two things he calls them to want flourish in exile and to grow where they're planted flourish in exile and grow where they're planted in a land they don't want to be in amongst the people with whom they don't fit they are called to flourish and grow and I'll say this, I know that, that many Christians, more and more in this world, they feel like, like we don't fit in, in this place, like we're out of place in this world. It's like we're exiles on this planet. And the temptation when we are at a place where we don't want to be is to run and to hide. Not to be a light of the world, but to run and to hide and to find an escape. But what if, what if, it, what if... God is calling us during our time, like the people here. What if our call is also where we're at right now? What if the call God has given us is to flourish and grow? What if our call is to seek out the welfare of the communities in which we have been planted in right now today? And what could that look like for us? Is it prayer all over our communities as the schools regather in these new ways? Is it just walking around neighborhoods and asking God's favor and blessing over all the neighborhoods in which we live? Is it wherever you go extending kindness and generosity and patience, including online, especially right now on social media, extending kindness, generosity, patience wherever we go? This, pa this passage has, part of what I was excited to share with you today, even though like, they may not like this, is that this passage has incredible relevance for believers in, in, in our time. For the Israelites in exile, I mean, it is a hard, this is a difficult word, and it gets worse. Verse 10, this is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you, and fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place. Verse 10, Jeremiah 29, 11 is preceded, right, by Jeremiah 29, verse 10. So before all that I know the plans I have for you, they're given this word about 70 years. Seven decades. So let's make it clear. For that generation of Israelites who are in exile in Babylon, they're not going home. They're not going home. What this tells them is they and likely their children will live and they will die in Babylon. There's a promise of return, but it's going to be for the next generation. Those who are receiving this letter are being told, are, 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 are being told this. I mean, we are, as we look at it, we are reading about one of the low points in all of the history of ancient Israel. Seventy years they are told. Like right now, like apply it to right now. I know there are all sorts of opinions and thoughts and ideas when it comes to COVID and the pandemic and what we're in the midst of, midst of right now. But early on, I'm, I was hearing people say things like, like God wouldn't allow for this. This can't be God's plan. Like this won't go longer than a few weeks, right? Like, like God wouldn't have, God wouldn't make, make us wait longer than six, like make, make us wait longer than, than six months. We were like two weeks in and I was seeing leaders go, we've been doing this a whole 15 days, like a whole, a whole 15 days. God wouldn't allow for any of this. 70 years, they're told. Now, okay. I want you to remember what we began our time reading Jeremiah 29, 11. And I told you it's a verse that takes place in a specific context um, or plot. And now that you know what that story is, I want to read the verse for you one more time 
For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. Again, it is a beautiful verse filled with words of hope given to a people who are on the edge. They are on the brink in the midst of heartache. And the call they are given is to not give up, even though they're going to have to to die to like a thousand dreams. They are told and called to not lose faith. It reminds me of some words of the Apostle Paul, uh, where he writes, uh, 2 Corinthians 4, he writes, Therefore we do not lose heart, though outwardly we're wasting away, yet inwardly we're being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes. Grace Church, that's what we need to do right now. We fix our eyes, not on what is seen, but on what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Resilience, perseverance are, are, are only developed through difficult life circumstances. So the Israelites, they're given this call to flourish and grow in a place they don't want to be. And so if you've ever felt in that place of exile, the question, what it becomes, the question becomes, even for what we're dealing with right now, can anything good out of being at a time and place like this, can anything good happen in exile? Go to verses 12. Then you will call on me, and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. And you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and I will bring you back from captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and places where I have banished you, declares the Lord, and will bring you back to the place from which I carried you in to exile. In exile, what's gonna, can anything good happen in exile? What's going to happen in exile? The people are going to find God again. In their homeland, where they were comfortable, they had forgotten. They had turned to other gods. But now in exile, there will be a restored relationship. The distance between them and God will be brought back together. There will be reconciliation. The people will come back to their first home. And they'll realize home was never primarily about a place or any of the conveniences that come with a specific location. For them, home is about their God. Some of you might be wondering, okay, 70 years, what happens 70 years later? Well, Babylon is defeated, and there's a new empire with a new king who shows generosity and compassion to those in exile. This is from the book of Ezra, beginning in chapter 1, verse 1. In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord spoken by who? Spoken by Jeremiah, the Lord moved the heart of Cyrus, king of Persia, to make a proclamation throughout his realm and also to put it in writing. This is what the Cyrus, what Cyrus, king of Persia, says. The Lord, the God of heaven, has given to me all the kingdoms of the earth. He's appointed me to build a temple for him in Jerusalem and Judea. Any of his people among you may go up to Jerusalem and Judah and build the temple of the Lord, the God of Israel, the God who was in Jerusalem, and may their God be with them. Now, I love, I love that line. He said, may their God be with them. And he was. And so I'm just going to ask you today, like, what is your Babylon? What is, your, what is the situation in your life where you're like, I, but God, I don't, I don't want this. I don't want this circumstance. I don't want this situation. And I would ask, could it be that for a time, God is calling you to flourish and to grow, even in the midst of your Babylon. That God is arranging life circumstances to lead you back to Him. I recently read the testimony of a woman who had spent most of her life living far from God. She came to a point where she wanted to know more, to know more. So she studied as much information about God as she could. She told herself that when she had enough information, she would commit her life to Him. But at some point, she realized her issue was no longer about a lack of information, but that she had commitment issues. She knew that if Jesus had been raised from the dead, that that fact, that fact changes everything. And so she decided that she wanted to confess her sin and accept God's gift in Jesus Christ. But she wanted uh, it to be a very clear change in commitment. So what she did is she went home and she went in her kitchen and she looked at the threshold between her kitchen and living room. And she said out loud, God, when I step across that line, I want you to know I'm all in. I'm leaving my old life behind and I'm embracing your forgiveness. I'm embracing Jesus as my savior, my friend, and my leader. My leader. And then she did it. She cried cross over the threshold. She stepped over the line, which she said was the greatest step she had ever taken in her life. And so I'm asking you today, have you ever taken that step? If you haven't, today could be that day. I I would want every one of you to know uh, that you have been forgiven and that you are unconditionally loved 
And I would love for every one of you to be able to walk in the fullness of life that only Jesus Christ can offer. And so others of you may have marked that day. You may have made that commitment in the past, but you've been running from God and you've just gone off course. And the Holy Spirit is doing what he does and is speaking into you. And you know it's just time to come home and to renew your faith. Either way, what I want to do right now is I want to, I would be honored to lead us in a prayer. And so if you would like to receive Christ today, you can pray these uh, words uh, with me aloud where you are in your hearts. And then after that, I'll pray a prayer of recommitment. So if you would like to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior in this moment, you can pray with me. God, I thank you so much for this day. I want to receive your gift of, of new life. I want to ask for your forgiveness for all of my sins. I want to ask for your spirit to make a home within me. I want to thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, for his sacrifice and for his resurrection. I want to walk as your child, your son, your daughter. And I want to just thank you for forgiving me and giving me life in Jesus Christ. I want to follow you now and forever. I pray this in Jesus' name. This is for some of you who just, you've prayed that prayer before, but you want to recommit your life in this moment. This is your chance. You can pray with me this prayer. God, thank you for bringing me back home today. I'm sorry that I have been, I've been doing my own thing. I'm sorry that I've not been walking the fullness of life that you've offered to me. And I want to ask for your forgiveness. I want to renew my commitment with you. I want to return to my first love. I desire to go back to first love faith. And I want to seek that lived out in every aspect of my life. I just want to come home. We thank, I thank you again for Jesus, for loving me in Jesus, for giving me in Jesus, and for the life that we have in his name. God, and I also, God, I just want to lift up all of Grace Church. I want to lift up all the collective Babylons that are out there right now. And I pray, Lord, that people would just lean into you in ways that maybe they have not leaned into you in a long time. And I ask grace and mercy over this community in every single way, Lord. We thank you that there is even the offer to flourish and grow even in the midst of exile. So God, I thank you so much for Grace Church and for all my brothers and sisters out there. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. And all this grace said, amen. Now, if you prayed any of these prayers, here are four ways to let us know that you've decided to take a next step. One, you can let us know in the comments, in the chat, I just prayed that prayer. Two, you can text us at 626-671-2606 and you can let us know, again, I prayed that prayer. Third, you can click on the link in the comments and you have a form there. You can fill out that form and one of our team members will reach out to you. And then finally, you can meet with someone. You can talk to someone right now who will pray with you. It's for anyone who needs prayer this morning, all right, these Zoom rooms. But especially if you've made a first-time decision, prayer counselors are waiting for you. Just click on the Zoom link in the comments. Uh, the Zoom meeting ID is on the screen as well and you can go right to there. Our, the team here at Grace would love to pray for you. Finally, Grace Church, I just like, I just want to thank you all for allowing me um, in this space to have, to, to be a part of your ministry um, for these three, three weeks. I've been honored um, to serve in any way. I know that Pastor John is so excited to jump back in here and get back to doing what he does so well. You have an amazing team. He's an amazing pastor. I love this guy. Um, so your church family is going to continue to be in, in, in my prayers. And I appreciate any prayers that you said my family as well, but much love. Um, um, to you all and God's best um, over your lives.